that we feel your presence here today. Thank you, God, that you are alive, that you're alive, that you're with us, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So grateful for what I feel today in the presence of the Lord. So glad that we have a church where we're sensitive to the movement of the Spirit. But you don't have to stop on a particular stanza, but you can allow the Spirit and the presence of God to begin to touch and minister and the people have room to respond to God's presence. If you've not been in a church like that before, then it may be a little bit uncomfortable for you. You think, man, what's, what are these folks doing? But trust me, it's just people that are feeling God and that are responding to God's love and presence. That's what's going on. People just loving their Savior. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're really thankful that God chose to join us today. You may be seated if you'd like to be seated. So grateful for all the guests, and obviously I haven't got to meet every single one of you, but we are so glad that you're here today. Many probably traveling from out of town, maybe here visiting family, and we are thankful that you chose this day to be in the house of God here at Goodlettsville Pentecostal Church and uh, celebrate your presence and celebrate, more importantly, the presence of God, that we truly believe your life can be impacted for eternity today. Your life can be forever changed. And so whatever you came needing today, know this. These songs that we sang are not just words, but they're truth. And that our God is greater than anything you're facing today. And he's able to meet you at your point of need. And he's able to pick you up and to give you a brand new way. That's our Lord. That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, thanks to everyone for being here today. We're going to be uh, talking today. It is Sign Up Sunday for small groups. Y'all may have heard pastors say that. It's a big day. It's a big day when people are, are gathering around their small groups and what they're going to be, who they're going to be connecting with over these next several months. And uh, it's an important day. It's a big day. And we want to make sure that you guys are in a small group. So with that in mind, today we're going to be talking about relationships matter. Relationships matter. We're going to take our text in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 13 and verse number 20. Proverbs 13 and 20. It says, he that walketh with the wise, I'm sorry, he that walketh with the wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now let that marinate in, in your spirit a little bit. This is uh, uh, attributed probably to Solomon. And, and it says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I think a lot could be different in our world today if people would just make the right relational choices. A lot could be different in a lot of scenarios and we could look around and we could isolate and we could start picking out what could have been different here, what could have been different there. And there's lots of people throwing lots of spaghetti on the wall, but at the, at the fundamental core of it, your relationships are in fact shaping who you are. Those relationships matter. Now we talk about Solomon being the writer here. Solomon was obviously the son of David. And I'm going to run through a few kings here. Some of them you may not be as familiar with as others. But, but King David, obviously Solomon was his son. They were the kings of the United Kingdom. Everybody was under, uh, all the children of Israel were all united under their reign. Now uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he, he made the decision uh, to, to, to tighten the screws down on the constituents of, of the country. And when he did that, there was rebellion. And, and so the kingdom became divided. At that point during Rehoboam's reign, the kingdom was divided. And you had a kingdom of Israel and a kingdom of Judah. They both had separate kings. Now, if you do your historical study, what you're going to discover is from that moment forward, you really didn't have a lot of good kings in the kingdom of Israel. I don't know that you can go back in the lineage and find, okay, this guy was a good king. Most of the kings of Israel followed an evil pathway. Uh, on the flip side, on the kings of Judah, you had a mixed bag. You probably had probably less than half, 
were actually what would be considered, we would consider good kings. Uh, the bulk of them were evil kings. And so where I want to begin today, you had Solomon, which followed David, and then the divided kingdom and the Rehoboam. And so after Rehoboam in the kingdom of Judah, you had Abijah. Then after Abijah, you had Asa. Now Asa was one of the good guys. After Asa, his, son name, his son's name was Jehoshaphat. Today, we're going to be spending the front part of our lesson on Jehoshaphat. I want us to pick up a couple of things. I want us to learn a few things from the life of Jehoshaphat. Now, how many here have heard of, you're familiar with King David? All right, keep your hand up if you're familiar with Solomon. And then as we go to Abijam, okay, there you go, that's what I thought. All right, you can put them down. Asa and now Jehoshaphat. Now, how many have even, like, at least heard the name Jehoshaphat? You may or may not know that much about it. Okay, you, there's a couple of places you can read about and learn about Jehoshaphat. It's going to be in, in Kings, uh, but the, one, the study we're doing today is going to be in 2 Chronicles. And it's a span of about four or five chapters that actually talk about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was one of the good kings of Judah. He actually wanted to follow after God. His dad had been a good king. He had followed a couple of uh, just terrible kings. The span from, from, from the king of Solomon until Jehoshaphat became the fourth king after Solomon was 61 years. 61 years had eclipsed. Now, Jehoshaphat was born after Solomon had passed. And so he never knew his, his, his great, great granddad. His great, great granddad was Solomon. And so thankfully, he had a great father. Asa was a, a great man. We're going to start today in 2 Chronicles chapter number 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And we're going to, do, I just want to reiterate that, that Jehoshaphat was one of the good guys, right? And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David, which would have really been his great, great grandfather David, and sought not unto Balaam. So we find that Jehoshaphat is following Christ. It says, but he sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in the, I'm sorry, but he sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. As I explained to you, Israel were wicked. They were not following uh, after the commandments of the Lord. And so we find in this, this first chapter that we're referencing him is chapter 17. Again, 2 Chronicles, if you want to read through it, we're going to cover about five chapters in about four verses. And so you're going to have to go home and do your homework on your own and really read this story to really sink in, let everything sink in that, that, that happened in Jehoshaphat's life. And so I want to fast forward now. We're, we're finding that Jehoshaphat was prosperous. He had done really good. God had blessed him. It, it's amazing when you follow Christ and the hand of God is on your life and you make wise decisions and wise connections, it's amazing how you, you can be blessed and how God can honor that and how he can, he can provide for you miraculously and, and he can open doors that, that seem to be, that no one could open. But, and so this takes us now to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. It's the next chapter over in verse 1. And it says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. People were loving them some Jehoshaphat. They loved him. He, he had full of honor and abundance. And, and this next phrase should concern us all. This is a great king, loved God, turned the kingdom, was making sure they were facing God, doing the right thing. But then there's this comma in this sentence. And it said, and joined affinity with Ahab. Does anybody want to take a guess as to who Ahab was? Ahab. I didn't hear you, so you're probably right. Ahab was the king of Israel at the time. Now, what do we already learned about the kings of Israel? They were bad. They were evil. They didn't follow uh, the, the, the commands. And so they were not God-centered. They were, they were idol-centric. They, they, they followed idols. They had stuff that they burned to and worshipped. And the, the, the magnitude of their idolatry was ridiculous. And especially Ahab, because you may remember Ahab's wife. Does anybody remember Ahab's wife? Yeah. Jezebel. And how many people have named their child Jezebel? Uh, that's what I thought. All right. You don't get a lot of affirmations on that one. Why is that? Jezebel may have even been more evil than her husband. I mean, and that's hard to do. Ahab was a bad dude, but, but Jezebel was right there with him in her badness. I mean, they were a, a, lethal, a lethal combination of bad. And, and so what we find is for some reason, 
Jehoshaphat has decided now to have a relationship with Ahab. Now, why would you do that? An evil king that doesn't appreciate your God, that has idols, that doesn't believe what you believe, that doesn't stand for what you believe, and yet you want to join in affinity with Ahab. But that's what happened. Now, hey, we could make a hundred excuses probably for him. I mean, if he's like some of us, Jehoshaphat could have been saying, oh, but you know, Ahab really, I believe in his heart, he knows the truth. And if I could just get connected with him, man, we're going to do us, uh, we're going to win him back. He, we're going to win, the, we're going to bring the whole kingdom back under one reign. And, and he may have, he honestly may have had those thoughts. He may have been reaching out to, to King Ahab in order to, to restore the kingdom. He may have had pure intentions. We really don't know that. He may have just been allured by power. He may have been allured by the possibilities of riches and greater, uh, making more broad his kingdom. We don't know what ran through his mind, but we can only imagine as human beings ourselves. So what we find is he joins an affinity with him and he says, hey, We've got this battle going on. Why don't you join us in this battle? Joseph says, why not? So now has he not only got an affinity with it, he's now joined together and he's going to war with Ahab. So this guy, this Jehoshaphat, that is the king of Judah and a great king, read the history, a fantastic king has now made a poor relationship decision and it sends him into war with a idol-worshiping king. Now, let's go to the next chapter. Chapter 19, verse number 2. And it says, And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him. Went out to meet him where? The truth be told, he went to war with Ahab. But Ahab never made it home. Ahab was killed in that battle. We find Jehoshaphat comes back Home. He comes back to Judah. And this is when Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him. And he said to King Jehoshaphat, now get this, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from the Lord. Now there's wrath upon you from the devil. We want to blame the devil for everything, right? Oh man, that car pulled out in front of me. That was a devil. Yeah, probably not. Could have been you were in too big a hurry. Could have been a lot of things, but it probably wasn't the devil. And so, so here we, we find that wrath is upon Jehoshaphat, this great king that was doing the right thing, that was leading, that was connecting people back uh, to, their, to, their, to the real and true God. And, and he just simply made a relational choice that was a bad one. And when he did that, we find that he's now going to experience or the, the wrath of God is going to be upon him. Now, how many here would sign up for that? You want the wrath of God on you? Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. I wouldn't expect any hands to be raised. No one wants the wrath of God, but you know what? He didn't either. He didn't go into this relationship saying, you know what? I'm going to do this uh, because I think I'll get the wrath of God. Of course not. He went into this relationship like we do with our relationships. Naive, Maybe th thinking, oh, oh, but I can, I can change them. I can make a difference. Young people, listen, I can make a difference in them. It, yeah, they're, they're, they don't go to church and they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 but you know what? They, they've got, some, they got a good heart. They're, they're good people. Their family's good people. They're good people. Okay, be careful. You don't want to run into the wrath of God. The good news is, is after the prophet comes to him, or the son of the seer, Jehoshaphat again says, you know what? Not me. I'm not going down that pathway. And we find a repentant Jehoshaphat. You can find that in the next chapter, in, in, in chapter, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 32. And it says, and he walked in the way of Asa his father and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So he, he writes the ship. He repents and he says, oh no, not, we're, we're not going down that pathway. We're going to serve God. And he, he, man, once again, just pushing everybody toward God, everybody toward God. That's in verse number 32. Verse 32. But man, 
do we humans have problems with lessons learned? Do we have problems remembering what has happened, how bad it hurt, and then how God forgave us? Do we have issues with, with remembering the bad? And man, sometimes we just have this rose-colored past that we forget about all the pain and the hurt that came from that crazy relational decision. And all we think about is the glory days. And somehow Satan diminishes the pain that we, we felt. And he wants to make, oh, but wasn't that a great time? Wasn't that a great season? Here? Like, wasn't you having fun? Forget about the pain and the loneliness and the tears cried into the pillow and, and, and the, the fact that you were frustrated and hopeless during that season. He don't want you to remember any of that. He only wants you to remember that, man, that was a good season. He, he, he never wants you to remember the pain that was caused from it. So I want us to go three verses later. Three verses later, 2 Chronicles 20, 35. And after this, did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahazi, king of Israel. Now, I told you Ahab had died. King Ahazi takes his spot in the kingdom. That's his son. But here's the, the sad part. He didn't just do wickedly. Who did very wickedly. He said, you know, Ahab was, my dad was pretty wicked. I'm going to turn it up a notch. I'm going to be very wicked. And so this smart king, this godly king, has now for the second time decided that I'm going to make a bad relational decision. I'm going to join myself with an evil king that is into idol worship, doesn't believe in the one true God, and is a wicked individual. And that's going to be my Peer choice. That's what I'm going to choose to hang out with and to do life with. As a matter of fact, you can read this story in, in this chapter. They, they build this fleet of ships. Uh, again, that, that leads me to believe that this wasn't all just pure uh, motives. They build these ships to go to Tarshish. They, it was a, a commerce business, basically, that he was getting into with him. Okay, there, there's probably a message there. Be careful who you join with, who you get into affinity with, even in the business matters, because he was, he was building all these ships and they were probably going to make tons of money. But again, you can read it for yourself. There's another prophet that comes by and again has a conversation with Jehoshaphat. And he says, because you've done this, your works are going to be destroyed. Because you've made the choice, your works are going to be to be broken. And what we find is all those ships that they had built, they were probably a big enterprise. All those ships were broken. It was a complete loss. I don't know how he did it. I don't know if it was a storm. I don't know if, if, uh, if he had uh, some uh, wood-eating insects that come on and destroy the ships. I don't know what happened. But somehow, all their work, that combined, combined effort for, for this good king and evil king combined was brought to complete naught. So we can look at our relationships and you can say, well, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. You know, there, there, there's some good that can come of this. We can, we can do good. And if we do good, then I can pay my tithes and I can bless the kingdom. And, and man, that maybe, maybe during this journey, I'll, I'll draw them over to the, to the, to the good side. You know, uh, I'll, I'll have them over and they'll, maybe we'll commune. And, but let me, let me tell you, we're not talking about witnessing here. We should be open and, and loving and kind and, and willing to speak with anyone in regards to their soul and bringing them to Jesus Christ. I believe we're, we, we can't take ourselves out of this world. We are the light of the world. What I'm talking about here is who are you putting yourself in affinity with? Who is your life people? And if we're choosing life people, if we're choosing marriage partners, and thankfully our group, man, hats off to this group, of young married people that have done it the right way. You've connected with people that are in church. I'm so proud. Every time I see a young man or young lady making a wise relational decision, it makes my heart happy because I know they've given themselves a fighting chance in life. Because I've seen before people make bad relational choices. And I've seen the destruction that ensues and the pain that ensues and how it is painful even for us to watch from afar, much less them to have to live through it because they simply made bad relational choices, sometimes against even godly counsel. And they paid the ultimate price 
for that. They're paying for it, even some still today, because they made bad relational choices. And so it was with, with Jehoshaphat. He paid a price for it. But unfortunately, this is not really the point I wanted to make today. Let's, let's go one more, one more little snippet of 2 Chronicles. Let's roll to the next chapter, chapter 21. We're going to read verse 4 and then verse 6. It says, Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, his father was Jehoshaphat. This is Jehoshaphat's son now. Jehor Jehoshaphat is now passed off the scene. Jehoram is now risen up to the kingdom of his father. He strengthened himself. Now get this and slew all his brethren with the sword and divers also of the princes of Israel. So he destroyed all of his brothers. He took all the princes of, of, of Israel and he killed them all. So this guy steps into the throne, slaughtering people, mass slaughter when he comes on the scene. Now granted, his, remember his dad, Jehoshaphat, was a good king. He loved God. He just had a couple bad relationships, a couple of people he connected with that somebody must have been watching. Let's go to the next scripture, scripture number six. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He didn't walk in the way of his father, the king of Judah. He walked in the way of the king. Why was that? Why would you? What kind of influence could they have in his life? Like as did the house of Ahab. Okay, we're starting to connect the dots, right? For he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. Four. Why did this happen? Four. Four. He had the daughter of Ahab to wife. This happened because he had the daughter of Ahab to wife and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, raised in the kingdom that God raised in a, in a house, in a palace that knew that God was God. He was the one true God, didn't believe in idol worship. He was never taught that from his palace. But he was taught that from his father's relationships. You see, his father survived, right? Jehoshaphat survived. He would make amends and, okay, I lost, a, I lost a lot of money there. I lost some ships. And he's just going through life saying, okay, I still believe in the one true God. I, man, I, I'm a one God, apostolic, tongue talking, the Lord, have more than believing in the liberating power of Jesus Christ. But watch the spirit baptized. You know what I mean? Come on, he knew the song. And so, so here we are, and, and he said, well, it's all good, right? I mean, yeah, I paid some prices. It cost me a little bit. There was some pain along the way, but hey, God forgives me. But tap the brakes here, Jehoshaphat. See, it's not just about you. It's not just about you. See, here's what happened. He might have been taught who God was, but his dad's relationships taught him a whole nother lesson. His dad's relationships told him that you can be, you can not even believe in God. You can have idols everywhere. You can worship false gods. And evidently that's cool because dad and him were buds. And if you're, your dad's friends, your dad's friends, they're the cool ones, right? Your dad don't know nothing, right? Now, Hannah, that's not true with you and Levi. Your dad knows it. But a lot of kids, their dad, their, their, their dad don't know anything. But man, you, you get some of dad's friends over and you get some other peers over. Oh, they're going to listen to them. They're the smartest people in the world. Yeah, they're smart. That's dad's buddy, Ahab. Oh, I saw Ahab. So he was paying attention to what Ahab was doing. I mean, he was a friend of his dad's, right? How bad could it be? Dad hung out with this guy. They went to war together. Man, I've heard some war stories about it. Ahab and, and dad. Man, it's crazy, man. So his relationship with Ahab didn't necessarily destroy him but it absolutely annihilated his family. All his sons were killed by his one remaining son who was evil inherently. Why? Because he married Ahab's daughter. And now if Jehoshaphat had chosen not to be buddies with Ahab, maybe, just maybe, he never sees Ahab's daughter's eyes batting in the spring winds. Maybe, just maybe, he's not hanging out at the table and they're not having dinner together. He says, hey now, I know she likes idols, but man, that girl is fire. I mean, we can help her through that. I mean, after all, 
Dad made it through with Ahab, and I can help her, man. She's, she's going to be a one-god apostolic tongue down on Roman. I don't know what he was thinking, but what he wasn't thinking about is this relationship pleasing to God. I mean, why did he ever stop and ask that question? Why didn't Jehoshaphat ever stop and ask that question? Is this relationship pleasing to God? See, Jehoram was learning all the time, not necessarily from what his dad said, but what his dad done. He was learning from every relationship his dad had. Okay, parents, okay, grandparents, your kids are watching. They know who you hang with. They know who you run with. They know who you're in business with. They know. And those choices are going to influence and impact your children and your grandchildren. It's going to happen. We can act like it don't because there's no immediate pain. See, that's the kind of people that we are in America today. There's no immediate pain, so let's keep rolling. We only stop usually when it's painful, the same thing with the children of Israel, read the stories. Until they were desperate and hurting and pain was just oozing from their life, then they would call on God. Until then, just keep rolling. This ain't so bad. Just keep rolling. But sometimes pain has a way of waking us up. And if we'll admit it, which is hard for a human, do it actually admit you were wrong? So if this is you today, parent, grandparent, and you've made these ridiculous choices that at the time seemed to be so benign, no big deal. Have a conversation with your children. Let them know that daddy wasn't right. Mama wasn't right. We really shouldn't have been there. We really shouldn't have been doing that. That should not have been happening. And daddy is sorry that I even exposed you to that because I didn't help you when I made those relational choices. I didn't help you when I was doing my thing, thinking that I was telling you what to do, but I wasn't showing you what to do. And we need to apologize to our families and we need to say from this point forward, we're going to get this right. We're not going to make this mistake. We're not going to lose our, our family to the daughter of Ahab. And that he became an evil king. There may be a reason. There may be a reason that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in his second letter to them. 2 Corinthians what chapter are we in? We're in chapter number 6, verse 14. You've probably heard this one. Your parents probably told you if you are a kid. Be not, I hope they did, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He asked a good question here. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What, what are you, what, what's the job there? Are you righteous? Then why, why are you finding joy and contentment in an unrighteous relationship? And what communion hath light with darkness? Again, I want it to be fully understood. I'm not talking about you shining the light of Jesus Christ into a dark world. Every single one of us should be doing that. We all should have some kind of surface relationships, per, uh, peripheral relationships that are trying to win people to Christ, drawing them in, bringing them in. But I'm talking about the people that you're doing life with, the people you're connecting with, the people that are in your life. We have to understand that communion has no, I mean, light has no communion with darkness. They don't mesh and it won't mesh. And if you think it's going to mesh, you're not going to be the first one to prove God wrong. It's not going to happen. And you're going to suffer for it. Young people, you can make that decision. It's been made thousands of times before you. And you're not going to be the one that says, oh, but it's going to be different with me. It's not. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And he's trying to deceive us into thinking we can connect with whoever we connect with as long as I do the right thing. I'm telling you, you're going to suffer for it and you may lose your family over it. That's just the way the Bible has laid it out for us. And so it tells us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers that light and darkness do not have communion. So today, this small group sign up. Today, this small group sign up. And I want to tell every single one of you that we should be intentional about getting connected with people that are followers of Jesus Christ. You should be intentional. You should look for opportunities. I, I can only speak for me, but I love to be around people that make me better. I want to be around people that stretch me. Man, I got to hang out with the Wilkerson's a, a couple of times. Just love the fact that, man, I feel like when I'm around them, you leave 
better. You leave strengthened and encouraged. I love that. And we should be seeking those relationships where when you're around people, you leave there better. You feel clean. Have you ever been in a, in a, in a situation where you left and you felt, <laughs> felt like you need to take a shower, you know? That wasn't so good. But when you're in a relationship and you leave and you feel better and you feel clean, you thought, man, that relationship kind of washed me. I kind of feel good uh, based on this communication, this time spent together. And you need to have those kind of relationships. You need to connect with people that are following Jesus, that are Jesus followers, not just in word. You, got, you can walk out the door, do you believe in Jesus? And uh, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in Gulletsville that don't believe in Jesus. Are they following Jesus? That's what I want you. I want you to be connected with someone that's following Jesus. And small groups are a great way to, com to make connections with like-minded Christians. So for whatever reason, you may have been one of the few that have chosen not to be a part of small groups. Maybe it's because it's too long a drive, and, and maybe it's because uh, you just aren't that kind. You don't, you don't meet people well. You can make excuses, 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 excuses. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you what you need. I'm not telling you what's comfortable. I'm telling you what you need. You need to have people in your life that are going to make you want to follow Jesus. And if you don't have those people in your life, there's going to be moments where you could be upended. The Bible proves this out. We're here as a body together. You're not doing this by yourself or should not be doing this by yourself. If you're doing this by yourself, you're not doing it the Jesus way. You show me a time where Jesus did ministry alone. Those moments were rare. He found times to pray and get along, absolutely. But most of the time, he was with people, right? He had his three amigos, the three guys that were tight with him. And then he had his 12 disciples and he ministered to hundreds and thousands of people. And you're no better than Jesus. You're not as strong as Jesus. You're not as powerful as Jesus. And yet this is what he modeled. And you think you can be the long ranger? You think you can be the guy that does this by himself, the girl that does this by himself, the couple that does this by themselves? You are not wise if you take that approach. You need people in your life. I need people in my life. That's the reason we have the church. We have the church for community and for growth and development and for love and for care. That's why we have the church. And hey, this is not something new. This is not something that we invented at Gulletsville. As a matter of fact, you can go back to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at that scripture. Now, everybody knows what happened in 38, right? Has anybody ever heard the scripture Acts 2, 38? You familiar with that one? Uh, six, eight people are? Okay. You might want to read that one. This is like eight verses later. So by now, like you've already, you've already got, got your shout on, you quit reading, right? I hope not. So here we go. Verse 46 this is those same people that were probably in that upper room or at least the uh, part of the 5,000 that came that later th that, uh, that day. So every day, these are those folks, these Jesus follower people, you know. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. And they ate, come on, somebody. I like this last part. And they ate their food, <laughs> With joyful and sincere hearts. Man, that's one good thing about our growth group. Mm. Man, we can eat some food with joyful and sincere hearts. I love that. And so, so they broke bread from house to house, and they were in the temple. And it used the word together. Did you notice that? They didn't go to the temple by themselves, and they weren't in the house by themselves. They went to the temple together. They were in each other's houses. Ha, ha. Ha. Ha, ha. They were in each other's houses. They were doing life together in the community, in houses, families connected and united together. And they didn't, they didn't forsake the assembling of themselves together because it says we're to do that more and more even as you see the day approaching. You can probably find that in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, I think uh, that's right, Trent. So you, you can look that one up. But, but don't forsake the, 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 the assembling of yourselves together. Was, and they didn't. They were together. They were together at church. They were together in houses. This is how they did Life. You see, God and the church was the center of their life. Somehow, over the process of a couple of thousand years, that seems to have drifted, doesn't it? And that Sunday's, oh man, we gonna go to church on Sunday. That's God's day. Well, how about the rest of the week? 
Is that somehow not God's week? The bottom line is, is we serve God every single day and we need each other every single day and we need brothers and we need sisters that will come alongside us and encourage us and lift us up. Let's look, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Why do we need a group? We need people in our life that are going to provoke us to be better. They're going to stretch us. They're going to encourage us. They're going to, they're, we're going to be accountable. Boy, ooh, that's a tough word. Nobody wants to be accountable. I'm my own boss. Oh, yeah. That ain't going to work out too well for you. You need somebody that can look you in the eye and say, what are you doing, man? I'm thankful I've got people in my life. I'm thankful God has put people in my life. I've got people, I've got friends that God has allowed me to meet from, from different, I mean, I've got Eugene Wilson uh, in Texas that did a, did a very tough season of my life. Man, I was there, I could talk with him. He was a friend that, that would make me better. I, I've got, I've got uh, man, I still stay in contact with Brother Johnny Sansom down in, he'll call me, man, and we'll talk about stuff and we'll share life together. Uh, man, I, the Jordans down in Huntington, you've, you've, they've been here a, t a time or two with us. They've started a little, uh, they're helping develop a, a ministry there, a, a small, small church there in Huntington, Tennessee. But man, we can call and, and we can pray and, and we can cry and, and we can share life together. It's having relationships like that that matter. And thankfully, God has placed many, many people in my life through the years. But you know what he's given me these last few years? He's given me a small group. That's what he's given me. And you, I've got people in my small group that I can trust, that if I picked up the phone, they would be in my house as quick as their little feet or car would carry them. I tell you what, we're going to say, now the Millers aren't here today. They're traveling, took a week and a half vacation. Like, what's up with that? But anyway... <laughs> Anyway, I hope they've had a great time. I got to see a couple pictures and I love, love Evan and Dorian Miller. They're, they're in our small group. So I, I want, if you're in our small group, I want you to stand. I mean, I want you to stay standing. You're going to be standing so long that you're going to be embarrassed. I want you to stand up. Everybody that's in, in, in our small group. All right, I got the Elkins back there. I, oh, look at Sister Nene. Don't we love Sister Nene? We got, to, now, Sister, no, I said you couldn't sit down, Sister Nene. You got to keep standing up. I'm bragging on you. Me and Sister Nene have been doing ministry and life together I don't know how many years. She was part of our first, uh, one of our, she was an early member of our senior leadership team. Phenomenal. And man, we've just, we connected and we did life together. The Burgles, now hey, hey, the Burgles, you've been here three, three, less than three years. But man, you're talking about some dear people. We, we said, hey, I don't know if they're involved in a group. We want, we're going to invite them to our group. I don't know if we're connected anywhere in the church. So we want them to be in our group. And man, are we forever glad that we invited them to be in our group. You're talking about people that I could depend on? You can depend on them people. Those people are those things you can build something on. They're, they're great people. And I'm thankful that God put it in our heart to have them in our group. The Elkins. Oh, wow. The man of a million nuggets right there. I mean, Marty might not say much. But when he says something, you better write it down. That's all I got to say. But me and Marty have ran together. We don't do it as often as we'd like. And we've had conversations at tough seasons we, we have. And I'm thankful that I can trust Marty. I can trust Marty. I can feel safe with Marty and with Amy. Amy, man, Amy helps our group. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. If you want to, I mean, we've been, we've, 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 we've talked about family. We've talked about, there's been tears shed in our group. We do life together. We understand that we have needs and we need each other. And Amy and Marty are right there. Of course, my beautiful family. Oh, look at him. He's excited. He gets the moment in the spotlight. Hannah, Levi, uh, and, and my beautiful wife. And uh, they put up with me. I, I won't talk about them very much, but they're, they're great people too. And then uh, over, over here, over here, we got uh, Josh. Now, they're only, I, I don't see, where's Ivy? Is she with her mom? Okay, Amber's probably working somewhere. These people are the people that are like doing everything at church. And so if you want to know what they're doing, they're doing something at church. Uh, he'll be grilling hamburgers today. It's just uh, him and Toby, I think, are doing the hamburgers, right? I mean, I've got some real, real, real winners in my group. And so, but here's the thing. They came to, you've been here probably at our church four years, something like that, five, something like that. But you know what? I thought, man, it's a new family. I like these people. Let's connect with them. Okay, they're part of our group now. And they have been for years. Man, these are some of our best friends in the world. Love them to death. I mean, we got kids and they're crazy together and they're fun together. And we, I mean, it's just we do life together. Now, the pastor was talking earlier. The Elkins, they, 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 they're going to minister to the peak 60s. 
Oh, so they're graduating from our little group. Now, hopefully they'll be back, not to diminish the peak 60s, but they're going to be leading the peak 60s. But here, here's, the, I just want you to see, I want you to think. So when I knew the Elkins weren't going to be in our group anymore, I said, you know what, there's a new family that's been coming. It's the Catons. Now, y'all, uh, how many, I, I, I would embarrass you and ask you to raise your hand if you knew them, but you probably don't. So the Catons, and I've just noticed, and I said, hey, are you guys involved in a group anywhere? No, I mean, we've been, uh, Jesse's come to the church a few times and we thought maybe we'd just gather at the church. So I talked to my group and I said, hey, what do you think about us inviting the Catons into our group? They're a new family at church. We don't know them, but we'll get to know them. We didn't know the Birdwells that well either. And so we've asked the Catons to be on this journey. I don't see the Catons. Are you here? If you are, throw something at me because I haven't seen you. All right, hopefully they're enjoying a vacation or something. If not, then we'll have to have a serious prayer meeting. But, but anyway, so we've invited them. You, you may be seated. But the, this, is, this is our group. This is who we do life with. Now, granted, there's some kids. Is it messy and loud sometimes? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. But man, do we have some fantastic food. All right, and we have great discussions too. And we surround the Bible and we dive into the Bible. But these people give me strength. They give me life. I can pick up the phone at any time. And I, I believe with full assurance, I could call any one of them. And they would do whatever it takes to meet the need that is in my life, whatever it takes. If I needed money, if I needed a ride, if I needed a, 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 a place to lay my head, I'm telling you, they would be there in the snap of a finger. Because why? We are in life together. We're in community together. We're doing it like the Bible told us to do it. And I know that those relationships matter. That my kids need to be in relationships and they need to see me in relationships with healthy Christian people. They need to learn from dad's and mom's example that it matters who you surround yourself with. I can't just tell them that. I've got to show them that. I've got to live that in front of them. And you've got to do the same. You've got to connect with people that make your family better. You've got to grow and you've got to develop with people that love Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Does anybody just sometimes need a little encouragement? That's what we're for, guys. We're here to encourage. We're here to lift up. We're here to bring everybody toward Christ. I want to read one more scripture context for you. I realize it's 1134. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12. <clears throat> and you can stand if you'd like to. It may give you a chance to stretch your legs. Maybe a little more oxygen flows to the brain. And when it does that, maybe you'll actually remember some of this scripture. Ecclesiastes 4 Verse 9, you've heard me say that I really like, enjoy the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes and that is so true, so true. But man, this, this scripture setting is so powerful. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, two are better than one. You don't need to do this by yourself because they have a good reward for their labor. Now that's assuming that it's a good relationship because remember the reward for the bad relationship was busted ships and busted family. So, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. There's going to be a day, the day will come, when there will be something in your pathway that causes you to stumble, that causes you to fall. And it's then that the people that you've surrounded yourself with become even more important than you ever realize. It's then that you realize who is with you and what their heart for you in Christ really is. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Next verse tells us, again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12. And if one prevail against him, I mean, if somebody's taking me out, and I'm having a rough time, and I'm in the battle of my life, two shall withstand him. There's something about unity and partnering with another Christ-centered individual that gives us strength and victory. This says, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. I want us to focus here in the remaining moments of this sermon on this three 
fold cord. Remember that relationships matter. The most important relationship that any one of us will ever have is with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. If you don't have that relationships, then really nothing else matters. Because you're here for a short time to determine where you want to spend eternity. That's why we're here. We're put on earth to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we, some do, some don't. But that's why we're here. We're here to prepare for a marriage with him. He's preparing a bride. Amen. So the reason you're here is to serve Christ and to love him and to be in relationship with him. And there is no greater relationship that you'll ever experience than your relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no greater peace that you'll ever experience than the peace that comes from knowing that Jesus Christ is with you. There's no greater hope than in the hope that we will be raised someday to spend eternity in heaven. There's no greater hope than that. So I want to talk to you about a threefold cord. I want you to know Jesus. And if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus, you haven't surrendered your life to him. You know about him. You've heard the name. You've heard stories. But you have never really said, okay, today I'm giving my life to you. I'm not doing it my way anymore. I'm going to do it your way. And you've made that decision or you haven't made that decision. Today is your day. You desperately need to make that decision. And along with that decision, we need to make sure we have other people in our lives that are focused on that same ending. Here's what I know. This life's crazy. The world is crazy. You don't have to look too far right now to find pain, to find evil. People and families that are hurting. There's, there's families this morning that are, that are crying. There's people this morning that are experiencing loss at levels that we probably can't even understand. There's people today that are getting horrible news. One of my buddies that I, that I crossed paths with running, his wife just diagnosed with cancer, stage four. Got an email, pray, brother, pray. He doesn't attend our church. He's a, he believes in Christ. But man, what an opportunity for God to show himself strong, to touch her body. They're great people. Charlie, Marsha, love you guys. And if we can do anything for you, but I want this church praying for Marsha, Marsha Herndon. See, Jesus can meet you wherever you're at. And whatever it is that you're hurting with today, he cares. He really does care. And he wants to lift your burden. He wants hope to be extended to you today. He don't want you to leave here without hope. Our world is hopeless, guys. That's why they're doing crazy stuff. They have no hope. All they have is their master to their own selves and to really to, to, their, to, their, to their enemy, to the Satan. The, the, and, and, and until we change our focus and we understand that this whole world spins, it should spin around a, a return to godly fear and a love for truth and for righteousness. So if you have a need today, Whatever it is you're experiencing, if it's your body you need to touch, God's the healer. He's healed my body. I can stand here and tell you several instances in the last two years where there has been a miracle in my body that God has answered prayer specifically. God's your healer. God's a way maker. God's your provider. I can testify that God is your provider. So if you're struggling today, could it be that you haven't relinquished the authority of your finance to your king? Is it possible that you've tried to do that your way? And it's hard for God to bless you because you're not giving it to him. Is that possible? Is it possible that you have destruction in your life because you had affinity and made bad choices in your relationships, but God, like Jehoshaphat, can forgive you and you can put that behind you and you can move forward making wise relational choices. Some people are hurting today because of relational choices. There's pain in your life and you know what I'm saying is true. Just come and give that to God. God can bring peace and healing into a heart that no one ever understands, that you can't even articulate to somebody, but he can meet you and he can make a difference in your world. So as they begin to sing, 
I want each of us, if you have a need or if you have a, a somewhere, something in your life you need God to touch, I want you to respond to God today. I want you to come forward. If you want somebody to pray with you, then there'll be those available to do that. But I want you to find a place with, with God. And I want you to connect with him. And I want healing to happen in your life today. And I want new life to be given to you today. So you can come today. You can come right now. Anybody that wants to come. Healing in any area of your life. Financial healing. Physical healing. Emotional healing. Mental healing. You need a touch. You need God. You're desperate for help. You know you can't do this by yourself. But you need God and you need people. I want you to gather. As these come, I want, I want some, some believers. I want some believers to gather around them. I want somebody up here praying for them. You can come now, if you, especially if you're a part of the, our, our altar ministry team. We want you to come. And I want you to connect with, with some of these individuals. And I want, I want to pray together. I want them to know that they're not in this alone. That there's a church that believes that God can change their lives. That God can make a difference for every single person here. So if, and if, if, you, if you want to just come and, 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 and thank God for where you're at. Thank God for the relationships in your life. Thank God that he's always a present help for you, that I want you to do that. But I want us to cry out to God right now as a body of believers. I want us to cry out to God right now as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him for his wisdom and his direction and his blessing in every facet of our life. Let's pray together. God, I thank you today that you are the miracle worker. I thank you today, God, for every life that has come forward today in need of a touch from you, God. They are desperate. They, they stepped out of their seat and they walked to the front because they wanted to feel your presence. They wanted to be touched by the master. They wanted your hands upon them today and they wanted to feel the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that every single person in this room realizes the importance of their relationships and, and, and that what they do in their relationships in this world carry so much weight. God, I pray that every single one of us will submit our relationships to you, will filter them through your word and through your love. God, bless this people that us submit to your will, surrender to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's surrender to him right now. Every single person, whatever you're facing, I want you to lift your hands and your heart to, and I want you just to give it to Jesus. So whatever you need help with, tell him right now. This is what I need you, God. This is where I need you, God. I want to give you my life. I can't do this without you. I can't do it without help. I need you. I need people. I need strengths. I need encouragement. God, I surrender and I submit to your plan and to your will for my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, may every heart be touched. May every need be met. May lives be encouraged today. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus.